Vamos a dar unos cuantos avisos. Por favor, mantengan sus micrófonos apagados hasta el momento de las preguntas. Eh, eh, hello, everyone. First, uh, until the, the next people get in, let me give you some advices. Please uh, have your micros off and you can put it on when you want to ask a question for the question, question open rooms. Thank you. Okay, now let me give the admit for the next few ones. Okay, so good day, dear colleagues. Today we have a special lecture full of history, full of philosophy. Neurosurgical Colloquium, the philosophy of a neurosurgeon. First, let me make you a few advices, questions about residency in the United States or questions about the USMLE will not answer. 
and uh, you will you will feel please feel free to have uh, or making questions in the chat box or put on your microphones in the final part of the lecture. So let me introduce you the speaker. We have here a Dr. Giuseppe Lancino, MD, Joseph and Barbara Ashkin, Professor of Surgery and Professor of Neurologic Surgery and Radiology, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We are Muriel Tagli, President of the Peruvian Student Society for Neurosurgery and Neurosciences, and I welcome you, Dr. Giuseppe Lancino. Please feel free to start. Thank you, Muriel, and uh, it's uh, really true pleasure for me to um, have the chance to talk to you all. And uh, uh, this is going to be very informal. I just uh, prepared a few slices just to say a few basic things, um, just a few suggestions, uh, something about uh, my teachers and um, a little bit of my journeys and here, a few, here and there a few stories. Um, what I try to do, basically, I, I try to think, okay, if I had to go back, what are some of the really important uh, things that I've learned or just uh, simple words that somebody told me along uh, the way that uh, helped me a lot and that uh, might be, I hope, uh, helpful uh, uh, to you um, in your career. So this is a picture with uh, Dr. Lowe's, one of my mentors. It was um, hard to believe, but uh, about uh, almost uh, 30 years ago, we were making rounds. And um, as I was interviewing uh, to get the position as a resident, Dr. Lowe's told me, treat every patient as one of your family members. And uh, those simple words, uh, I, they were so important to shape uh, uh, what I do every day, I keep reminding myself. And uh, and then all of a sudden it occurred to me that if you are able to really consistently do that, you will be a great, a great doctor. I've, um, you know, we are all uh, in, in medical, as we go through medical school, especially if you are looking for an academic career, we are all, uh, competitive, we like to be the best and uh, do the best we can. And that's great. But um, I learned that um, as you go through the process long term, uh, um, and this might sound uh, um, simple, but um, it's important to be honest and to maintain a very high level of integrity, no matter what um, you do, no matter what stage uh, you are. And uh, this is one of the very famous uh, uh, businessmen, but uh, it's also somebody that um, has a, is very wise and uh, has a lot of common sense. And uh, he said it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes uh, to ruin it. So if you think about that, you will do a lot of things differently. And um, as you go through residency or as you start your clerkship, try as much as possible to go and check things yourself. If you are called because there might be a question, there might be a potential problem, go and check the patient yourself. It will avoid a lot of mistakes and uh, the team and particularly the nurses will appreciate you a lot. If you order a test, make sure that you check the result, but also make sure that uh, the patient and the family, that result is communicated to them as soon as it is available. It's inhumane. There is no reason why a patient should be waiting a long time to know the result of a test that uh, might quite often uh, might affect the trajectory of their uh, uh, or their life. It's important when you talk to patients, it's, uh, it goes a long way. If you're able to convey 
to patients and families and to make them understand the complex things. This is again, you know, uh, my mentor, Dr. Lowe's, one of my mentors was, is um, uh, one of, is the world expert on pituitary surgery. And uh, uh, he, when we were in clinic, he immediately would uh, gain uh, the, the trust of patients and their families because he would put the MRI and he would say, okay, you see, this is the pituitary gland and it's right in the center of your uh, head. And this is the nose. This is the front. This is the back. And uh, the pituitary gland, we can operate. We don't need to go through the brain. We can operate it through your nose. And immediately patients and families, they were feeling like they were understanding an MRI and that would be very helpful and very powerful and immediately establish a report of uh, uh, mutual uh, uh, trust and uh, 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 patients would, you know, in their family, they, they will uh, really like if you do that. This is a picture of, uh, for those of you that uh, follow soccer, this is Dino Zoff. Dino Zoff was the legendary goalkeeper of uh, the Italian uh, uh, national team that won the World Cup in 1982. After the World Cup, he won the World Cup uh, uh, at the age of 40. And the following year, or at the age of 42, he retired. And when uh, uh, they ask him, he said, well, what are you gonna, are you gonna miss anything? And he said, yes, I'm gonna miss the smell of the grass when uh, uh, every day when uh, I, um, I don't have to train anymore. And um, I put this uh, to um, make sure that uh, no matter what you do and where you are, is that you enjoy the process. Remember, this uh, medical school uh, residency, these are the best years of your life. So no matter where you are, make sure that you enjoy the process, that you enjoy it, because eventually, once it's gone, you will miss it. And uh, this is uh, myself with one of my co-residents, uh, Jeff Elias, the last day of my residency. Here it's in clinic with one of my other mentors, Dr. John Jane. And uh, I, as I said, uh, make sure you enjoy the process. I like Zoff, I miss the, the medical school. I miss the training. I wish I could go, um, I wish go back and start again because at the end it was a lot, was very hard, but it was a lot of fun. This is another of my mentors, Peter Giannetta. This uh, was the chairman in Pittsburgh. And um, Peter Giannetta used to say, read the three, three pages of textbook every day. And uh, another of my teachers in medical school, one of the cardiologists also used to say, make sure you make a habit to read uh, about medicine one hour every day. Why this is important? Well, it's important because um, if you make a habit, you say, well, an hour every day to read about medicine, that's, that's easy to do. But believe me, if you do it consistently and if you do it every day, you will have an edge over most of your colleagues. The same thing about uh, as you go through medical school, it's important. There is this tendency we tend to study for the test, forget the test. You're studying for yourself. This is the only chance you have about learning about medicine. And to study a textbook from A to Z will allow you to get uh, to gain a systematic approach and uh, to, learn, um, to learn about um, everything. Now, it's important, as I said, you need, must be honest. You need to have integrity, but at the same time, we, you know, we need to be realistic and not always uh, things are going to be um, are going to be easy. So this is uh, Michael Dell, the founder of the Dell co Computer Company. So you know it's important to um, be nice, but of course you also need to be you know tough enough that uh, you play um, to try to win. 
And then, as I said, uh, uh, don't uh, lose track of the fact that at the end, uh, uh, the most important thing is uh, um, to be happy in life. And um, again, Warren Buffett uh, says, I know so many people with the more money that you can imagine. And if they have bad relationship with their family, they're really unhappy. And then I know many people that have just the basic means to live but they have great relationship with their family and they are very, and they're very happy. So happiness at the end, it's not related to your, to the position that you have, it's not related to material things. So make sure that no matter what you do, you find a way to have uh, intrinsic happiness because uh, that will transmit to everybody around you. And they say that, you know, a person to be happy needs three things. Uh, somebody to love, so relationships, friend, and family, something to do. And uh, we are lucky that we do something that is incredibly exciting and engaging. And uh, we have the privilege to help other people if we know what we're doing, of course. And then it's important, uh, especially when you're young, it's important to have something to hope for, something uh, to achieve that keeps you um, you know, on a trajectory to, um, uh, to get somewhere. Never forget, uh, every patient has a story. This was a, a young boy 30 years ago that um, we treated uh, for uh, a brain tumor. And uh, he loved fishing. And um, I was a racer at that time. And he had nicknamed uh, me uh, Fishing Joe. So Never forget, if, if you want um, to remember every single patient, it's very easy. Just uh, talk to them, uh, ask them about their story. Everybody has a story about their family, what they do. And you will remember every single of your patients, no matter how many patients you'll see. Now, I know that as you go through medical school, you go through residency, there are a lot of... Um, uh, things uh, might become uh, uh, routine, and uh, but um, I always um, um, remind you to keep everything in a perspective and just think about. If you think about just a simple uh, um, night on call, uh, you know you go to the emergency room, you are called because there is a problem. You say, "Oh no, another night on call! What a nightmare!" So that's one way to look at it. And I can tell you one thing, that if you that's how you look at it, you're never going to enjoy your profession and uh, you're going to be at very high risk of getting burned out. But then there is another way to look at it. And if you think about uh, all the emotions that you will be part of that night on call, um, somebody that a uh, young person that uh, was going to a party, got into a car accident, you need to go and communicate to the parents that uh, uh, their um, son or daughter has now has had the head injury and is admitted in the intensive care unit. Uh, the elderly lady that was at home and uh, he fell, she fell as she was trying to get out of the chair, you have to go and tell the granddaughter I'm so sorry, grandma, grandma, your grandmother is never going to be the same because she fell. So if you look at all the human aspects uh, that uh, go on through a simple night on call, then uh, I can tell you that there is no, I've not been able to, I cannot read the literature anymore because there is um, no, um, no uh, fiction book that can give me the same degree of uh, intensity about life than I can get through a day at work if I consider the human aspects behind every single patient, every single um, MRI. And then uh, make sure that you follow and you surround yourself with people that are positive, people that have positive energy, that want to learn, that want to get better, not Stay away from people that complain all the time. Uh, life is short. And uh, if you follow yourself and you are positive yourself, then uh, everybody around you uh, is going to feel uh, uh, is going to feel that uh, positive uh, energy. 
and um, you know, make sure that you choose uh, great mentors is another of my mentors, Dr. Uh, Grand, uh, an incredible gentleman, uh, neurosurgical uh, connoisseur and uh, very skilled uh, uh, neurosurgeon. And uh, don't waste time. You know, time is the most precious commodity. Uh, the 20 minutes uh, that uh, you have spent uh, listening to me, they're never going to come back. So I hope that I can say something useful to you. And uh, again, uh, use time uh, wisely because it's the most precious commodity and uh, the time, time does, not, um, uh, does not come back. And um, that's all I wanted to say, just to you know, put uh, things a little bit in perspective, um, hopefully make you think a little bit. I'm uh, happy to try to answer any question that you might have. Again, I can give you my, um, my view. Uh, and uh, also remember that uh, it's very important to listen to different uh, people, different opinions. But those, uh, what they are, they are opinions. And then you need to um, create your own uh, view of medicine, what you like to achieve and, uh, and so forth. So Uriel, I'm going to uh, stop sharing. And uh, as I said, uh, maybe I kept it fairly brief, uh, just a few concepts. Um, hope that we can, you know, have a nice conversation. Thank you, doctor. Well, it's a great lecture. While our assistants write their questions on the chat box or trying to push up their hands, I would like to ask uh, to ask you if the stoic life is important in a neurosurgeon. And here in Latin America, there is a lot of talk about it, about having a stoic neurosurgery life. Well, I, you know, I think it's uh, um, the way you approach things. Um, it's very important. And, um, you know, it's, um, stoic philosophy is just the one aspect and uh, one uh, potential um, approach. As I said, that there are, um, you know, in neurosurgery, we used to say there are different ways to skin a cat. Uh, and, uh I think uh, everybody has to find, uh, um, you know, once uh, we follow simple basic principles, everybody has to find a way that works for herself or himself. Thank you, Doc. Uh, there is another question. Uh, you said that we have to treat patients like members of our family. So how can we deal with bad results or bad news in that case? Well, uh, um, you know, most of the times we, we uh, deal and we meet people uh, when they are uh, often facing uh, a very difficult, um, difficult times. Um, they, I think that uh, the best way to be able to treat every patient as one of your family member without uh, uh, getting uh, too emotionally involved so that uh, you can carry on with a normal life, I think is that um, um, you need to reach that um, uh, that level where you feel comfortable that uh, for that specific person, you have tried and you have done your best. And I think that helps you to, uh, over time, to go through a uh, lot of disappointments. Thank you, doctor. So uh, I think one of our, our colleagues have another question. Mauricio Guerrero. Mauricio. Thank you, Real. First of all, let me thank Dr. Lenzino for the talk and for the for the tips. They're very helpful. And um, one thing I, I always wanted to ask people in the field, we know that neurosurgery is super long, super long, super long career. It's difficult, it's demanding, it takes time, it takes effort. How how can we balance our lifestyle, our normal life per se, with 
our neurosurgery career because life is made all of sacrifices and you have to sacrifice something in order to become the best you the best you can, the best neurosurgeon, the best anything that you want to do. How do we balance life, family, career, and maybe hobbies and all of that? Well, uh, I, um, I, I think uh, that um, no matter what you do, if you enjoy what you do, um, you don't really feel like you know you are working and uh, rarely feel like you are making sacrifices. Of course, you have to make to make choices. Um, so I think that, of course, if you like it, if you enjoy it, and um, medicine is something that is, you know, fascinating because you always learn, you always learn new, new things. And at the same time, you constantly have the ability to apply what you have learned as you go along. And I think that uh, that helps. And then I think it's um, up to everybody, each one of us has a um, different way to deal with, um, with that, you know, with your question. Now, the way I deal with that is that it's true that medicine is, uh, um, it's hard, but um, I can tell you that if you look at what uh, many other people in the world, they do for living, you know, most people have a much harder life than physicians. So my hat and, you know, my respect to um, people who work much harder than I do. Um, I think that's uh, the way I also look at it. You know, I consider what I do. Uh, I feel myself uh, privileged to be able to do um, what I do. And I think that also helps me to find a, a good balance. But there is no question that uh, you have to, to make choices. Thank you, Doctor. I, uh, on the same line, I think it's very important what you said. It's all about perspective. And we, if we change the, the idea of, oh, no, I have to be on call to, oh, I get to be on call, it's very different and it changes hundred percent the perspective of the of the surgeon it gets you in in a mood that you are happy about your work and you are proud of it and you are super grateful that you get to work on people and with with people so thank you for for the answer thank you mauricio francisco thank you excellent lecture doctor uh, i have a question for for our uh, what uh, advice can you give us for the first year students uh, to learn neuroanatomy, uh, especially in these times of uh, distance university in the pandemic? Well, uh, I, um, you know, the, the first year, it's a little bit uh, uh, difficult because some of the topics are a bit dry. And um, I, you know, the way I look at the first year of medicine or medical school, it's just, a, it's a, an investment, you know, it's you build the foundations. I, um, I, I think, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, I can speak for myself, but for me, the best way to study, you asked me specifically about neuroanatomy, the best way for me was to have uh, not only one source, but uh, two or three different uh, uh, textbooks. And um, what I would find that there were, there were certain things that were difficult to understand on one textbook. And then uh, another textbook would make it much more pleasant because they would have, for example, a clinical correlation. And then uh, when I um, went through medical school, I did not have, uh, I, I had didn't have, never saw a cadaver, never saw a brain. Um, uh, actually, in order to have access to a skull, um, I had to go to a cemetery and, um, you know, ask, uh, the person who was working there, if they had uh, 
uh, some skulls because periodically they have to, you know, remove, at least in Italy, it worked, worked that way. They had to remove uh, certain uh, uh, tombs that had been there for a long time and that were no more family. So um, I think that, um, you know, you need to be resourceful. Uh, but the first year of medical school, I would view as an investment because some of the topics, particularly like anatomy, even biochemistry, uh, there is a lot of mnemonization. You know, it's not, not only no matter how much, but if you have a good mentor, if you have good teachers, you know, that's the beauty is that uh, everything done at the highest level, it's interesting. And there are teachers that uh, make... Uh, dry subjects like sometimes anatomy can be incredibly uh, fascinating so that goes back to try as much as possible to surround yourself with the charismatic or positive people you can only learn and get better thank you doctor thank you francisco we have a, another another question for from our dear master and friend dr byron salazar dr salazar good morning um, uh, hello, Professor Lancina. How nice to see you again. Hello, hi. Yeah. How are you? I'm sorry because I'm driving, so I'm sorry for the for the shot. It's not that good. No, no. From your um, background, it looks like you are driving to the moon. <laughs> oh, yeah. From the background, <laughs> <laughs> it looks nice. Uh, first of all, congratulations for you, Professor, for those life lessons. I guess we all learn a lot about your experience and how you approach life and neurosurgery at the same time. And I have a question for you. It's a common question that residents always ask, how can I be a better resident? How, what is to be a good resident? What would you be your recommendations for those residents that you know they want to get good at neurosurgery, but they don't actually know what to expect in each year of the residency program? How would you approach that subject? Yeah, I, you know, like if we, if um, I look at uh, the residents that I would consider very good, that there is no question that there are some uh, common uh, traits, some common uh, characteristics that um, I think each one of us uh, can uh, acquire. Some people have naturally. Of course, as you go through the learning process, you need to be willing uh, to learn. You need to be willing to listen. Um, each one of us, especially when we are young, we can easily have our opinions and uh, uh, it's not uncommon you're doing an operation and sometimes the residents then might suggest you to do it something different because so uh that's great i think uh, it's everybody should uh, feel free to voice their opinions but um when as when you are a learner you you need to your mind uh, needs to be um able to uh listen and um but at the same time it's a fine balance uh, between uh, being what i say teachable and at the same time, uh, have a, a critical uh, view and make a critical assessment so that as you grow in your knowledge, you can uh, analyze, you can start analyzing uh, each step, uh, each problem uh, independently. So that's one thing. Passion is another thing. You know, if you're passionate about Dr. Salazar, uh, we had dinner uh, together not too long ago with him and his dad, and uh, we, we, <laughs> the restaurant was empty, <laughs> but we kept talking about neurosurgery, <laughs> even though we had had the very long days and we didn't realize everybody left. But why? Because we are passionate, we like what we do, and uh, it's, um, it's fun uh, to talk. So passion is um, it's very important. And... Um, and um, I think really these are the, really the main uh, traits, to being teachable in the sense that uh, being willing to listen and to try to absorb everything that you see, everything that you are told. At the same time, uh, have uh, enough uh, critical capabilities that as you advance and as you go, 
you start forming your own understanding and your own techniques and then uh, have passion and i think all that makes it you know those two things uh, are fundamental and they then everything becomes kind of easy dr salazar you have another question uh, you're muted doctor Okay, okay, thank you. Just to, to congratulate Professor Lancino for his wisdom. And I guess just a little bit, a brief comment, because sometimes I get that residents may think that they will be uh, the greatest resident if they have the most ability or they are, you know, the, the ones that can get uh, faster with their surgeries. And I guess that's a big mistake because as Professor Lancino said, there are so many a different ways of each resident that can be good at. Some are like uh, do a, a, a more a detailed a physical exam. Others, for example, talk a lot with the patients, know the life of their patients, their names, the last names. Um, others that they don't even know or they just know the, a number of a bed number or maybe a pathology and they might be a good surgeons. So ability is something that I guess uh, can be trained to work a lot, to train hard. And, you know, as Professor Lancino said, if we want to get to his level, we have to dedicate a lot of hours to the laboratory, to, to manual activities, to, to learn a lot, to read papers. And of course we will be as good as we can. And I guess, we all can be Professor Lancino. There is only one of him. And of course, if we are not, or if we don't get at his level, well, we can do uh, the best we can and that will be enough for us. Just about that. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Rian. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. So Dr. Lancino, let's check about our comments in the chat box. Yeah, do you? I can uh, read the, some of the questions. Yes. Well, there's one question. During your days as a medical student, how did you manage the emotional pressure when gain, getting to meet uh, critically ill patients? So that's a very good question. And uh, I would say the following that um, um, at the beginning, it's uh, very hard for everybody. Um, then, uh, um, it's, um, you know, uh, the life makes it a little bit easy in the sense that, uh, it, when it becomes a constant, um, you tend to, um, you know, we like it or not, we, we tend to notice a little bit less becomes, because it becomes a part of our life. Believe it or not, when I was young, my mother uh, was uh, really afraid about disease. And uh, she transmits, she has, you know, she's a teacher. She, so she didn't know much about medicine, but she, she had this terror about uh, disease. And uh, she transmitted that to me as a child. And believe it or not, uh, growing uh, through my childhood and adolescence, just uh, the hearing an ambulance would send me into a panic attack and uh, forget about going into the hospital. I, I couldn't uh, just, I was paralyzed. And here I am, it's uh, uh, six o'clock and I've been 12 hours in the hospital. So as you go on, uh, then uh, it, I would not say becomes easier, but you get a little bit, uh, you get uh, somehow used to it to the point where, as I said before, you, you, you know, you cannot let that become a routine. Um, you, and again, you try to do your best and that's how you can uh, deal every day with the lot of situations where there are result and the outcome is not the best, but at least you feel that you have tried your best. And then as you go on, um that um you know become so don't get don't don't get worried don't give up if at the beginning uh, it's um it's very hard to deal with critical ill patients uh, most of us uh, we have gone through that 
you know, through that same same stage, it's you just um, um, you just keep going and try to do your best, and then you will learn uh, how to um, to deal with that. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Alexa Martinez. There is another another important yes, question yes. Is that how necessary is a philosophy of life to balance personal no life and surgery? surgery. Now, yes. uh, you need to understand, it's very easy for me. I'm 57. I started the medical school in 83. So, you know, I've been into this for 40 years. It's very easy for me to sit here and pontificate. But uh, um, really, only in the past few years, I've been able to reach a level of uh, internal peace, I think, where I can uh, put into actions all those things uh, that uh, I, you know, talked about, about um, enjoying as much as possible every moment of it, try to surround yourself with positive and charismatic people and so forth. And uh, understanding uh, that, um, you know, life is uh, about, about the little things uh, and what you really need. So um, uh, that's why I, I realize it's important to have an overall uh, overarching philosophy of life and that uh, inner peace. But as I said, that's why I try to focus on those basic con concepts because that's what I, um, some of the lessons that uh, took me many, many years to, uh, to learn. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Luciana. We have another question from Lucero Berra Torres. Amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lancino. I have a question. What topics do you recommend we investigate as medical students? So I would recommend as a medical student, as I said, uh, study the textbooks, um, get over the fact, do not study for the test, do not study to pass the exams and uh, try a way as much as possible to enjoy. You know, if you follow your own journey and let's say you are now in the third year of medical school, it, you know, just uh, it's, you should be proud of yourself by just realizing that uh, only two years ago, you really had the very basic or no understanding whatsoever. And now you are morphing into a, um, a doctor. So appreciate the journey, enjoy the process. And uh, as a medical student, the same thing I tell my residents, this is the only time you have to learn about everything, no matter what your final aspiration is, especially in this um, um, day of super specialization, it will serve you immensely if you can be a complete doctor, because you're not going to be treating uh, the L4 herniated disc, but you're going to be treating uh, a full person. So study everything, immerse yourself, enjoy the process. And then if you, as you go along, uh, even as a medical student, it has helped me a lot to have an academic interest. You see something that um, uh, triggers your curiosity. You see something that intrigues you. Uh, nowadays, it's so easy. You go on uh, online, you find everything about that specific problem. You study in a month, in a month, you can become the world experts on a very little. So find a, a little niche here and there that uh, uh, way, about which you are passionate, and then it becomes also fun. But this is the only time you can study and learn about everything, and uh, don't throw that opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Karina Salazar Ask. How can we be happy in an area of surgery where the results, I think she means about outcomes, are medium to low? Well, uh, I, I mean, uh, you can uh, uh, be happy uh, if you have a sense uh, that, uh, you know, you have given your uh, best and that when you tackle a problem, you are fully prepared to do that. Um, 
that does not mean that uh, if uh, the results of something, um, you know, like medicine technology, they gets better and better over time. So if the results of a procedure, of a surgery, of the outcome of a disease, it's um, not great, well, that should challenge you as a young person to do everything you can and make your own, each one of us, uh, you don't need to be a super uh, researcher at the super specialized institution. Each one of us uh, can bring a contribution to the advancement uh, of the field. So if the results are not great, don't uh, be happy with the status quo, but that and try to um, improve things. But that does not mean that you should not be happy yourself. Uh, and the way to you can be happy is that um, you know you have given your best when you tackle a problem. And you make sure going through medical school, you study and you be the best possible medical student so that you know that uh, you get there prepared and that you did your best. Thank you, doctor. We have another question from Alejandro Tagli. What is the field philosophy of the researcher in neurosurgery? Well, I would say, I, again, I don't know if I understand the question well, but, um, you know, what's the philosophy of a researcher in neurosurgery? Again, uh, um, you try to, you should try to simplify your life and as much as possible. And then at the end, when you decompose everything into simple concepts, then there are a lot of commonalities. It's not only to neurosurgery. You know, if you want to be a researcher, if you wanna make contributions, if you wanna advance the field, then uh, curiosity, passion, the ability to identify, to see new patterns and, uh, and the ability to think outside the box and not necessarily accept um, uh, what is considered today a dogma. Just because we are in 2020 does not mean that in 2070, you, will laugh at what we are doing today, the same way we think that the medicine that was being practiced in 1950 was definitely not quite uh, in no way as advanced as how we practice uh, today. So the ability to have that historical perspective that what we are doing today uh, is gonna be um, not the same that what we'll be doing in 20 years, will uh, provide you with the philosophy of always trying to find the better and newer ways to do the same thing. Thank you, doctor. Um, Gabriela Salazar asking us how we can deal with a life of failure in family or work field. Well, uh, um, um, failure is part of life. And uh, um, there is uh, uh, no one that has not uh, dealt with, um, with the failures. Now, my philosophy is that uh, um, as long as there is health, then uh, everything else is fixable. And um, the way to deal with the failures is that failure is actually a very important, um, a very important part of everybody's growth. And um, that's where actually, when you see the character of a person, not when everything is going well, but the true character of the person, you see it when that person, how the person is able to get back up on her or his feet after falling with the face face down on the floor. So failure, especially when you are young, uh, should not be discouraged. You must fail. You must fail to succeed because failure, it's what makes you stronger. So every time you fail, like let's say how we deal with complications, where well, complications are part of what we do, especially if you do surgery, but also if you prescribe a medication or if you have to make decisions. So how you deal with failure. The first thing is that you need to have full awareness of what 
you could have done differently or better so that uh, the same situation uh, does not present in the future. So um, there is a Japanese, a Chinese war, word, uh, Ouija. Um, the characters are the same in uh, Japanese or Korean, except that uh, the pronunciation is different. But this word, this character means uh, disaster and opportunity at the same time. In other words, uh, there is always, that's how you deal with failures. As long as there is health, there is always a potential opportunity where, uh, where you fail. And then uh, if you are able to do that, when you look uh, back and uh, you hear that, uh, you know, especially if you uh, follow some uh, entrepreneurs, people have failed over and over and over. Now, you want to learn from your failures. You want to get stronger. You want to get better. You want to improve. But you need to have a situational awareness that you need to know and to understand uh, what you could do better so that you can learn from failures. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Dr. Lancino. Before continuing with the questions in the chat box, we give you the work to Emilia Machado from Ifenso Paraguay. Um, hello, uh, for starters, I would like to thank Dr. Lancino and also the Sociedad Peruana the Estudiante de Neurocirugía y Neurociencias for this amazing uh, lecture. And I wanted to um, ask you something as a, as a mentor uh, for younger generations that um, me, for example, as a woman, um, have to deal with some uh, expectations from society. Women have to be mothers. Women have to be caregivers. And, and sometimes this make uh, women uh, tend to not uh, choose some specialties, uh, for example, uh, neuro, uh, neurosurgery, because of uh, uh, the amount of hours it takes uh, and the amount of work hours that they have to, to provide. So um, I wanted to um, know which ones were um, your advices for younger women generations to pursue the, the, the field that they love, for example, neurosurgery. How would you uh, encourage women? In neurosurgery? Well, uh, I, um, it's a very important question. And uh, there is um, no um, question that uh, um, you are correct. Uh, it's, not, uh, um, it's not easy. I, I would not, uh, first of all, though, I would not view as societal expectations. You know, you need to understand what are your expectations. And um, there is nothing wrong uh, also to realize that, uh, you know, situations change over time. And uh, if you think uh, probably uh, two, three years ago, you would never ever imagine that you were going to be where you are right now. So, you know, you need to have that flexibility and uh, you need to understand uh, um, exactly what you like um, and how you like to organize your, um, um, your, um, your life. And I think uh, it's, um, it's important not to say, okay, what are my priorities? You know, of course, it's not a priority, say family versus neurosurgery. Well, it doesn't work that way. You need to find a way to be able, if that's, uh, th those, are, those are your aspirations, that's what you like to do, then uh, there are ways to do it. For your specific questions, I have uh, the ideal person that uh, can answer, and I'll be happy to uh, get you in touch with that. It's one of my colleagues, Dr. Maria Perisselda, uh, among other things, uh, she's from Spain, so she also sp uh, speaks Spanish very well. I, For me, uh, she is the ideal of everything. Uh, she does the most uh, incredible surgical cases. She runs uh, an anatomy lab, and they are doing incredible dissections. 
Um, she has uh, a, a great family life and a little girl. And um, um, I think uh, she can answer that question better than anybody else, especially as it uh, relates to your specific. So I'm happy to put you in touch with her. I would really love that. <laughs> So I will put uh, my email again. Somebody asked me to put my email again in the chat. You can contact my email. I know she will be very happy. I think she's the best one to, because I see she does everything. <laughs> and she can tell you exactly how it's possible. But it's, it's possible. And uh, But I would strongly suggest you do not worry about what society expectations are. Do not worry about what anybody, somebody else might say. You just need to work yourself and you need to understand that uh, in life we have to make choices and it's not about priorities. I don't, you see, I'm, I'm not even calling uh, sacrifices, but uh, there are choices. But I can also tell you that, uh, yes, it's very difficult to do neurosurgery, but uh, I see 99% of the world population that works much harder than I do. So how many uh, people, how many women, they're juggling two, three different jobs and still manage to have a family. So, you know, don't, don't let those considerations. But again, I, there is somebody I think I can answer your question much better than I can. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yep. This was an extraordinary answer, and um, uh, I I think you're an amazing mentor. As someone in the chat said, you are a capo. You're amazing. So thank you wow. so much for, for that. You're welcome. There are many, many, yes. many more people better than uh, I am, especially mentoring young uh, neurosurgeons. There is one question here: How can we start if we don't have mentors? Well, we don't have mentors. Yes. I, I think that um, um, you can always, uh, you know, you can always, uh, um, you can always meet people that, um, you know, you might find, uh, uh, you might get some inspiration. They don't necessarily need to be in the same, in the same field. And, um, and the other thing is that I would, uh, I was telling um, uh, Uriel as we were, we were talking a couple of weeks ago in uh, Bogota, you know, you, you can uh, reach out to people. Um, you know, you will be surprised if you reach out to it, you know, the, the worst thing is that somebody might in your, your email or might not answer, but more likely than not, you will find people that you think they are inspirational. And if you reach out to say, hey, look, do you mind uh, mentoring me or you know, spending some time helping me out? You will, you will be surprised how many people you will find along the way that just a, sometimes it's just a matter of getting in touch with those people. Thank you, doctor. I remember, uh, I think that you said, you said to me uh, before going to following questions, can, can we expand more this idea, uh, this phrase that you said to me that we need to be honest, honestly, we need to be, um, we need to have integrity and we, and we need to have to, to be uh, good persons. Can we expand that idea? Oh, no, that's, uh, you know, we were talking, you know, so that's what I, people approach me, say, hey, would you, um, can I, you know, can I follow you? Can, would you be willing to mentor? I say, sure, I'm happy to, I'm only ask those things that you are a good, you must be a good person, must be honest and have integrity. And then I say, I can, I can teach you in six months everything I've learned in medicine and neurosurgery, and then you you go and you will be better than I am. So, but uh, I think I think that's very that's very um, that's very important because it goes you know it goes long way and uh, it also uh, it's the fundament uh, 
to be able to you know reach um, internal peace and um, happiness so thank you doctor so mauricio you have a question yeah, thank you. Now that we are talking about mentors, I just wanted to ask, Dr. Lance, you know, how big were your mentors in your journey? Oh, they were, uh, uh, you know, like uh, I used to say I've been so lucky because along the way um, I've met so many people that uh, uh, they helped me where they really often they didn't really need to. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I also feel uh, the moral obligation myself to do everything I can to help people that might be in the same position I was 30, uh, 40 years ago. But then uh, the more I go, the more I realize that, um, yeah, of course, uh, luck is always uh, important and helpful, but somehow I kind of was also looking for those people you know i was trying to find them you know constantly and gravitate toward the people that had a certain type of um you know um attributes and then once i started my training in neurosurgery i made it uh, kind of like a point of um going to institutions where there were people that were charismatic and they had uh, they had certain qualities um, there is a question here what would you recommend to a patient with anxiety before entering surgery so that's a very important question um i you know like uh, when i come to the hospital uh, and um if i come a little bit usually I come in around 6.30 uh, to 7 o'clock, but sometimes I, I have to come in earlier. And the patients who are having surgery, they come in around 5, and they are in line to get registered. And every time I come in and I see that, I think uh, I cannot believe or understand how these people can actually stand in line and they're going to have surgery. I never had any surgery myself. I would be terrorized. So um, there are a couple of things to understand. Is number one, that uh, human nature is such that uh, we might think certain things are difficult for us to imagine. But once we are in, that, in a certain position and we have to face those problems, What's, what's our choice? We just have to face them. So that, you know, human nature is such that uh, uh, if put in a situation where we think otherwise it's unimaginable, then uh, we, you know, we tend to face that situation. And the other thing, the way I approach uh, patients, um, I, um, I think it's, um, it's very important, uh, um, you know, the human touch, I might, you know, pat their back. And I might tell them, I said, um, I know that you are very nervous. I say, well, uh, that's uh, I usually, you know, make them laugh because they say, well, that's normal. I would be actually nervous if you were not nervous because that would be odd. And then, uh, you know, try to reassure and um, hold their hand and say, don't worry, we'll take um, um, great care of you and um, we'll do our best and that I can guarantee. So that's how I deal with the patient that is anxious and is ready to go to have surgery. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Mauricio, you have uh, your hand up. Yeah, thank you. So doctor, what do you think? Of, of, it's this thing that I'm going to ask you is mostly for Latin American students. We're always talking about how we want to go out and train and get better. Everybody wants to go out of their country and nobody wants to come back. And what do you think? Should we leave our lives behind just, just to pursue our dreams and train and get better or at some point come back and get our neurosurgery in our respective countries better? Because in, in the development of Latin America, we are a little bit behind in neurosurgery and in medicine in general. Well, uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is a very important question. And uh, 
that is one of the reasons why I told Duriello, say, look, I don't want to answer questions about, you know, trying to get in the United States or because, um, um, you know, like, uh, look what I did today. I came to the hospital and um, I did some dictations. They were getting the patient ready to do surgery. I did one surgery. And then uh, I, um, uh, there was another patient that I seen yesterday came in for an angiogram. I went to look at the result and I told the patient what the result was. And then uh, we got ready, I did another surgery. And then uh, uh, as they were getting ready, I saw two patients. So I am uh, uh, from Southern Italy. And in Southern Italy right now, it's, um, what time is it? Six o'clock, people are going, getting ready to go out in my hometown. If I wanna see anybody, I just go to the center city, get some ice cream, and I'm gonna see all the people that I wanna meet. Instead, I am in a, you know, in a place where it's uh, still freezing outside. This morning was snowing. And what did they do? Tell me what did they do different that you cannot do it in, um, where are you, in Mexico? No, no, I'm in Paraguay. In, pa in Paraguay. So um, I'm a doctor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's the thing is that if you decompose in the, what did I do? I came into the hospital. I did a couple of surgery. I saw a couple of patients, did a bunch of dictations, and now I'm having, a, you know, a lot of fun uh, chatting with you. So, um that and you know uh, we were talking about choices and i would that's a sacrifice for me you know like it's uh, but uh, what i'm doing now i could easily do in my own my home uh town of course things are a little bit would be much you know much different politics and everything but you know there is a trade off uh, that's my my hometown and um people that i know and so forth um, what you are saying uh, would probably was um, true um, 40, 30 years ago. But um, today, things are different. I mean, you want to hear from me what I think, you contact me, and here we are. Um, so I think it's important. Uh, you know, I cut uh, my presentation a lot, but a lot of my presentation is actually about uh, going out and learning because every time you go out, uh, or, but going out meaning uh, going to a different place, uh, you learn something. You know, like from a neurosurgeon in Africa, I've learned how to always get the sharpest knife in the under the microscope, and you know what I do? Uh, this neurosurgeon taught me. You take a one cc to Berkeley syringe. You know that three. That ne the needle of that syringe. It's in the new syringe. It's always sharp, and it costs uh, ten cents. So that's what I use all the time. And I always have the sharpest knife in the hospital because of, so, and I've learned from a neurosurgeon from, you know, from Africa. So going around, it's important. Um, and uh, you will always be surprised the people that you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can learn from. I, uh, you know, I uh, um, was in a, but um, the world is changing and is changing rapidly. And nowadays, a student like yourself, I don't know what are your interests, but let's say you're interested in neurosurgery. Tomorrow, uh, there is a webinar that you can participate and you can listen to 10 world experts on any topic that you want. So uh, it's important to go around but that's now <laughs> that concept is much different um, the much different now and uh, it's always a, a it's always a trade off uh but i you know i strongly encourage what i can what i've learned i i left my home country italy but i also see that those people that we started together but they were persistent they put the work they in and out 
they are, first of all, they are as competent neurosurgeon as I am. And um, they've reached a good position just because of their persistency and the consistency of being in the same place and being willing to, to learn. So I would, um, you know, remember what I said, you know, stay positive. Don't sp in, in spend too much time complaining. Uh, life is difficult uh, uh, as a doctor in South America. <laughs> Believe me, I have plenty of colleagues who think life is not easy as a doctor uh, here. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the grass can always be greener. Um, I can tell you that one of the best lectures I've heard in neurosurgery was from uh, Dr. Salazar on ergonomics. And uh, so, you know, the world is uh, rapidly changing and it's important to be open. As you say, go out, but that is, today doesn't mean go out of, out of your country. I <laughs> say just uh, be open-minded and, and you will learn from all different sources. But uh, I think uh, there is uh, a easier sense of accomplishment and enjoyment if you can do it in your own country, despite the fact that uh, each situation, it's very difficult. But you know, when I was a student, forget I could do what Uriel is doing. The professor, the day after, they would not uh, let me take the exams <laughs> just because I was, uh, <laughs> I was inviting experts uh, that, uh, you know, like they would feel but nowadays you can do it. And, uh, you know, uh, we hope that Uriel will be okay. <laughs> so I, I think the, the world is changing and I would strongly encourage each one of you um, to do what you're doing, be the best at that. And, um, you know, we cannot, um, the world changes and um, who knows, um, you know, like uh, in the, um, 18th century, uh, you know, Spain was, Spain and Portugal were huge empires. Uh, in the 19th century was France. Uh, 20th century and the France and England. 20th century was United States. 21st century, you know, maybe China, I don't know. But, you know, the, the world changes and, you know, I would... Uh, I I would uh, really uh, do what you are doing, and uh, again, stay positive, and don't think uh, that um, you know there are problems and logistical issues uh, everywhere. And um, I always say, you know, what makes things impossible are people. Uh, otherwise, everything else is actually pretty straightforward and easy. So that's why you are kind of to, but. E Younger people are um, are a little bit different than you know prior generations, and you can uh, you can improve things. Thank you so much for your answer, Doctor. Yeah, we think we are part of the change. We're making a change, and we will see how neurosurgery and the world goes goes on with the years. Thank you so much. And you know, remember uh, to everybody uh, that invested the time to be in this. Uh, you know, we do real. Uh, we name this colloquium, colloquia, because we are hope uh, that this is gonna be an ongoing uh, thing uh, that we can do it. And you pick the topics, you pick what you wanna discuss. And you know, today is kind of in general discussion. Uh, next time, you you know, you you we can and you know i might might not be myself the best person to um discuss something but i can definitely help to identify people that uh, would help us in the process so now um you know while uh, we we think about um, other questions there is one thing i like to uh, say that i've been thinking an, a lot right here uh, as i said uh, i uh, spent uh, 40 years until now um and then uh, it occurred to me that uh, of course if i tell you well if you want to be a proficient uh, neurosurgeon not that i consider myself a proficient neurosurgeon i can i can do much better 
but um, um, okay, do what I did. And then all of a sudden I say, wait a minute. If I found the good students that are willing to learn and they are teachable, and if I am a good teacher, then I, I should be able in six months to transmit to what I've learned in 40 years. Think about, I mean, I, you know, I, if, I am a good, if I am a good teacher and I have a good student, then in, in six months, I should be able to compress. And I think that's what, you know, we should try to, to achieve. And sometimes it's difficult because as we become more experienced and we learn more, we forget how the, we do basic things without thinking anymore. And uh, that's a reason, one of the reasons, besides the fact that it was incredibly well-organized and uh, very informative, that's one of the reasons why Dr. Salazar lecture changed my way of thinking, because I realized, I say, you know, that's what we need to teach. We need to teach, uh, I can come here and show you an incredible case I did two weeks ago. Well, what are you gonna learn from that? I can uh, need to teach you uh, why I did, why I move in this way instead of moving this way and all these little things. So. Very thankful, doctor. And doctor, what is your, your opinion about the, uh, the students in the positioning of the groups of the global neurosurgery? At this at this time, I'm I'm sorry. I don't. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Like, um, what's the role the, of students in global uh -huh. neurosurgery? What's the role of students in global neurosurgery? Well, I, I think uh, I think the students have uh, a fundamental role in uh, global neurosurgery more than uh, um, anybody else because uh, really you are the future of global neurosurgery, and if you look at uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, the roster on this uh, uh, specific um, call initiative, um, that's a fairly large, you know, number of uh, leaders of the next uh, 10, 15, 20 years. So it's, uh, you, you are the ones that are going to shape global neurosurgery and uh, um, neurosurgery around the world is changing rapidly. I uh, told you, I was so happy to see so many Peruvian neurosurgeons at the World Federation meeting in Colombia. And uh, everybody had the beautiful presentations, beautiful slides, incredible cases. So, um, and um, by uh, you know, organizing uh, uh, things like this and uh, try to, as I said, uh, think differently. You know, like uh, uh, some of the webinars I told you, uh, sometimes they are showing vascular case and I'm a vascular neurosurgeon. 20, 20 seconds, they show some bypass. I have a hard time understanding what they are doing. So I don't understand what is the teaching, uh, <laughs> the teaching uh, uh, function or something like that. Besides saying, uh, you know, our self promotion. So by organizing something different, something that is truly useful, that's how you uh, shape uh, the future of global neurosurgery. So these medical students have an incredibly uh, important role. Thank you, doctor. Francisco, you have a question. Yes, uh, talking about places, I have a question about how to overcome the fear to go out from our uh, place of origin to learn uh, in, in somewhere else or even to speak another language. How to overcome this fear? Well, uh, uh, you need to understand that to fear is a natural, uh, natural uh, reaction. Um, uh, everybody has uh, fears, you know, don't think uh, that we go into a difficult operation and we are not fearful. Of course, we have uh, learned how to overcome uh, that fear. And as I said before, turn into an opportunity, uh, make sure that that sense of fear or worry so that you can perform at your best. So fear, it's a very natural, um, very natural uh, um, emotion. 
Um, and um, I had to move a lot at the beginning of my training. And every time I was fearful because every time you go to a different place, you had to prove yourself. And when you do it, I can tell you one thing, it's not easy, but uh, after you do it and you make new friends, you learn new things and you prove yourself every time you do it, it's a, you know, a growth opportunity. So I strongly encourage young people to change constantly, uh, not constantly, but as much as possible to change the environment during the training, during the learning process, because it's an incredible personal growth. And that's how you gain uh, also um, confidence in your own ability and your own skills. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. So uh, doctor, I have another question about the teaching assistants. What's your opinion about the students teaching assistants? You mean uh, student teaching assistants during um, during med school? Maybe some uh, students uh, laboratory assistants, students assistant of research. Yeah. So I, I think it's very important to be involved, and uh, that's also how if you have identified ways, you know, as a student, you are not only a passive learner. Uh, as a student, you learn. But uh, as I said, it's important to learn and absorb, but it's all equally important to, to, to grow your critical ability to um, try to figure out better ways of doing it. So it's very important that as, you, as a student, you also contribute to the teaching of fellow uh, younger students. And um, you yourself, uh, you know, my, it, you know, should not be something that you do just to put another bullet and improve your CV, but it should be something that uh, you um, improve uh, the learning process by, you know, not only bringing your knowledge, but also bringing your critical ability to identify ways that what you have been taught before can be transmitted and done in a better way. So I think it's a very important. And what I've also learned is that, you know, I often go to meetings. I'm usually part of the faculty, but I can tell you one thing. I realize now that the faculty often will learn much more from the meetings than the participants. Because of course, we, we come from a, you know, fairly, you know, high level of knowledge and uh, it's easy for us to pick those few new important things, as opposed to, you know, many of the participants are much younger or with less experience. So a lot of things are new. So, uh, you know, the, as if you have the ability to be a teacher, teaching assistant, uh, I would, uh, and uh, also it's important to develop uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, philosophy and that concept that whatever you do, you try to be the best at it. That it also goes along a little bit of to invest your time uh, wisely. I would love to disconnect in a few minutes because I have an appointment. I need to go at six thirty. But uh, as I said, uh, our hope was that this was just a way to break their highs and that um, we'll continue to do it. And, um, you know, this is, I, I, I like to do it if it's something that can be useful. Uh, today was, you know, very generic. Uh, next time uh, we can start, you know, uh, we can do whatever uh, the entire panel thinks could be useful. Thank you, doctor. Uh, before we're closing, um, have you a word for students or residents around there that want to be in a research in one day? Yeah, I think um, uh, there are, uh, you know, many areas, uh, every area of medicine is exciting. Um, you find uh, what is your um, passion, what you like to do it. 
Um, you know, every specialty, every branch of medicine requires a little bit uh, different skills. So you also try to match uh, with what, uh, you know, might be your uh, uh, skill set. Um, I don't have any any particular advice, except that, you know, if I can be of any help, uh, just contact me and I'll be happy to help if I can. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Byron Salazar, a word? Uh, thank you, Riel. Um, I would like to thank the whole panelists, especially uh, you for the invitation and Professor Lancino uh, teachings. Uh, I guess uh, it's an honor for me and for everybody here that we can actually uh, hear talking uh, one of the masters of neurovascular surgery in the world and to see how humble uh, he is and how open he is and how can he uh, give all his advices to to, uh, to 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 this new generation of neurosurgeons and students. And I guess uh, what you uh, have been doing as the Peruvian Society of Neurosurgery is something amazing. We know each other so many months ago. <laughs> it's not that big of time, but in this short time, I guess you have demonstrated that you are interested in neurosurgery that you are willing to participate, that you are willing to, to keep learning uh, from the masters. And I guess, um, I have no doubt that you will be great surgeons. You have this possibility that we didn't have, uh, I guess the pandemic, the, these virtual meetings change everything. And uh, we are talking with so many uh, surgeons, as Professor Lancino said, that want to help them, want to be part of this generational change. And of course, uh, for all the students that are willing to go into, sur into neurosurgery, uh, I guess you can do it, you will do it. It's long, it's hard, uh, it demands you a lot, but uh, I guess it's all possible because we know uh, how to deal with these problems, these challenges. And as a neurosurgeon, I guess you have to have this will to, to triumph, to win, and also to know that you can have a life besides neurosurgery. Thank you. Dr. Once again, Sir. thank you, Professor Lancino. Thank you, Riel. Hey, thank, thank you, you everybody. Invitation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Hey. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you to the panelists. Hope you can join us in the future sessions of Neurosurgical Colloquium. Thank you, Dr. Lancino, for sharing that part of your life to make us more conscious and better in the future. Thank you, Dawson, Doctor. Thanks all. Goodbye. Bye. Good night. Bye.